As part of our series Profiling Wellington Businesses, today I'm talking with Rachel Esson, National Librarian, about leadership. Kia ora, Rachel. Kia ora. Some people watching may be thinking, the National Library isn't a business. In what ways do you think there are similarities with a business? I was thinking about this and I was thinking there are more similarities, I think, between the National Library and businesses than there are differences. I agree. So we have services that we provide to customers, uh, we have a budget that we work within, uh, we're responsive to customer needs, managing staff, uh, managing service points and making sure that we're providing the services that we say we will. So I think uh, in all of those ways we're similar to a business. Where I think we differ is that we have that political layer, so we're also responsible to a minister, yeah. and we're part of a, a broader government sector um, workforce. I think businesses are often responsible to a board of some kind, so there's always a, a higher sure. layer. Yeah. Um, and how extensive is the National Library Network? It's not just this building here in Wellington, it's throughout the country. So how many people, how many offices? Yeah. How, how widely spread are you? Uh, we have around 350 staff and yes we have people located all around the Motu so we have a location in Auckland and also one in Christchurch. We have a storage facility in Wanganui and we have people working remotely from a number of different locations. And in terms of budget, what do you oversee? Uh, around $60 million annually and in addition to that there is capital funding for various projects. And would you like to tell us a little about the Tahubu project that you're going to be involved in, or already I suspect yes. become involved in and what that means? Well that is such an exciting opportunity, you know, it's a once in a lifetime uh, chance to be involved with new buildings that are heritage buildings and going to be part of helping Aotearoa preserve its, uh, its heritage. So it is a, uh, a whole program that consists of a new building, a new archives building which will be next door to the National Library building here in Wellington and joined with an air bridge. There's also a shared repository which is being built up near Livin. Uh, where we have the land, we're about to get the money to build that. And there's also um, the opportunity to work a lot more closely with archives and with Natonga Sound and Vision, who are currently housed within the National Library building. Uh, but we're really working more closely together to leverage the the things that we can do in collaboration and provide better services for New Zealanders. Wonderful. And the timeline for this? When, when well, we're, we're, breaking, we're, bre <laughs> we're breaking ground beginning of 2022 on the building next door. So oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. That's going to be very exciting. Just even yeah. as a librarian, but as someone in Wellington. Um, yeah, that's great. It's fantastic. So there are two aspects of leadership to your role. There's an external one where you are responsible for the leading of the organisation and defining its purpose and then there's the internal one leading of the people within the organisation and as you've just explained there's some big projects there's a lot of staff throughout the country what qualities do you think you need to be able to manage this? Yeah, I think uh, you certainly need to be comfortable with ambiguity and complexity you're never going to have all of the answers uh, it is an increasingly complex world that we're living in. So I think you need that ability to be able to uh, plan for multiple uh, scenarios and recognising that you've got big programmes of work that are strategically focused and um, have horizons to them. So you have horizon one is the work that you need to do now, which is kind of enabling work. But you've also got to keep your eye on that horizon two to make sure the things you're doing now are aligned and then horizon three of course is, is what you I suppose it's a bit of the legacy that you want to to leave so i think you've got to have that ability to to balance the, the now and the future i think you've got to have um good people skills and and be able to build relationships because so much of what we do 
is, uh, is about working with others. You know, we're, we're a national library, we, we can't do all of this on our own. We're part of a network of libraries within New Zealand. We're also part of a network of libraries internationally. Uh, we're part of the government sector, you know, so, and we're part of the GLAM sector, galleries, libraries, archives and museums. So being able to work across those organisations and work together collaboratively, I think is a really important aspect of, of the type of leadership that this role involves. And the strength in that is isn't going to be able to work with these other sectors. Oh, so it's all fighting for the same. Yeah, absolutely, and we're space. far too small a country really to be and competing in that one. When you were appointed to the role of National Librarian, you were gifted the title of Te Puaki. Tell us what that is and what does it mean? Mm. I, know, I felt so privileged and fortunate um, to come into the role as that uh, title had been gifted. So Po refers to the, the Po that are kind of welcoming um, aspects and, and, and stand for uh, leadership and huaki means to to open up um, and so together this this word it's a unique compound word it means um, that you're the the leader that is responsible for opening up the library and bringing people in so that you can share the taonga that you hold so it's quite aspirational and it's um, it's a lot do you of feel the weight of that? I do I do it's a responsibility uh, but it's also a really wonderful kind of guiding um, aspiration. Yeah. And quite unique amongst senior leaders in government departments. I can't think of anyone else that has been gifted this kind of title. Yeah, well, it's really interesting. Uh, we do, uh, within the department, uh, most, well actually all staff, are able to have their titles translated, but it is often a translation. Um, so I'm not I'm not aware of too many other roles that are actually kind of new words that are um, particular to the, to that role. So and I think it just shows the how dynamic uh, Tereo is that they come up with a new word, yeah. a new title. Mm -hmm. um, your career originally began here at the National Library many years ago, didn't it? And did you have ambitions for the top job back then in those days? Oh, hell no. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, yes, I started at the Alexander Turnbull Library as a uh, library assistant in the photographic archive. And I really kind of found, found my niche and went off to library school from there. And then came back to the Alexander Turnbull Library in 2012. Uh, so sort of came full circle um, and no, didn't ever have aspirations for the, the top job at all. Um, certainly always enjoyed being part of the strategic discussions and I think that's the thing that's probably led me into those sort of leadership roles, just wanting to, to be at the table where those, um, where those decisions were being made. Uh, at, at what point did you think seriously of getting some skills that would get you back on that path to um, making the most of any opportunities like this that came up? I think probably the, um, the decision point was when I was uh, managing the medical library at um, well, University of Otago but based here at the Wellington School of Medicine. And that was a great role because I was able to be in a leadership position but also still do some of the, the hands-on, the practical. I still did some teaching and I did uh, some work on the reference desk and I loved that combination. Um, and there was an opportunity at Victoria University that was moving more into the pure management side of things and so that was the turning point where I sort of had to make that decision to leave behind the hands-on and go into the, the more manage, management roles. And I think the thing that probably prompted me to do that was that sense that I wouldn't know unless I tried whether that was for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought I could always go back to a role that had the, uh, the practical aspect as well if, if I wanted to, if it didn't work out. So. Do you sometimes sit in a meeting and think, 
you know, it would be nice to be on the front desk. <laughs> well, it's funny you should say that because one of my New Year's resolutions is actually to spend more time uh, with National Library staff uh, on a, you know, just to actually make a, a weekly appointment, at least an hour, to go and um, spend some time with, with staff as they're doing their work because I think it's really important that I keep connected to that frontline work. Uh, but spend an hour with uh, the cataloguing team or with uh, someone doing arrangement and description uh, with the shelvers, with, um, with people on, on the reference room. Management by walking around, it used to yeah. be cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but also I think it, it reminds me why I do the job as well. It kind of brings a bit of joy when you're actually seeing what people are doing and, uh, and the value that they're adding. And, and, and you're learning, and I love that. I love that about library work. It's learning. also good for staff to see you there. I've worked for organisations where the CEO was way, just in the mm -hmm. same six months at a time. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, who is this person running the organisation? Mm -hmm. But to be approachable, I think, is very important for staff, um, for, you know, for a leader. Um, you're the ninth national librarian since the role was established uh, in the mid-1960s, yet you're only the third woman to hold the position, only the second in the role in my 30 plus years in librarianship, and this is despite librarianship being a female dominated profession. Why do you think women have been underrepresented in this top role in librarianship? Oh, I think there's a lot of complexity to that question. I think some of it is uh, women themselves potentially not uh, having that ambition or seeing themselves in the role. So there is always that you can't be what you can't see kind of thing. So if you have only seen men in that role, then maybe you think, oh no, that's, you know, that's not a job for me. Uh, I think the fact that the way we structure some of the work isn't always family friendly. Mm -hmm. So if you take time out uh, to raise a family, it is quite hard to come back in uh, at a senior level and you know be on, on that path. Uh, so I think it's it's complex, um, but I think I think things are starting to change in that way. When I look around at some of the other glam sector institutions. And previously, you know, roles like the sea at Te Papa, um, Natawa, uh, were held by men as well. And right at the moment, they're all held by women. And I think that's great. I think there's a bit of a, a turning point um, in that. Yeah, it's good to see. And you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding is that you are also one of the first internal appointments to the role of National Librarian. Certainly, you're the first that I remember coming up from within. Do you think this is a sign of organisational maturity? That we're growing our own leaders? Um, when I think positively, I think yes, that's good. When I'm being a bit more cynical, I wonder also whether COVID had an impact. <laughs> there weren't so many uh, international <laughs> applications. <laughs> and you were more than capable. <laughs> I'd like to think so, but um, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I think there's still more we can do in that, in that regard. Yeah. Um, and and I, that's certainly something I'm quite focused on, is really supporting internal capacity and giving people the opportunity to develop into roles. Yeah. That leads on to uh, my question about have you benefited from mentorship throughout your career? Has, um, have you had the encouragement from others within the profession to get here? I have certainly had uh, mentors, probably not so much formally, but people who I've formed relationships with who've been incredibly encouraging. Uh, I think that there is a lot more that we could and should be doing as a profession to actually identify talented people and, and wrap that mentoring support around them and, and to encourage them. And, and that is something that I've done to um, a number of staff internally where I've sort of said, actually, I think you could apply for this, you know, why don't you think about it uh, 
and, and that's really paid off. There's, there's some great appointments that have come about because of that support, I think. Do you have a formal training leadership program in the organisation? Uh, what I have put in place since I've come into this role is that I have a coach and that is someone who uh, was a former Deputy Chief Executive in uh, the Department of Internal Affairs and the role that she has played and the experience that she's got quite a lot of experience in particular working with people who have uh, been peers and then being promoted to managing um, a, a team of, of former colleagues and I recognise that that would be quite helpful for me uh, because I've been here for you know, a good number of years and I've worked um, with a lot of the people that I'm now you know, the leader of, I've worked with them as colleagues so it was being quite intentional about um, moving into a different relationship. There, and that, that's been really helpful. What makes a good mentor? What what if I'm an aspiring leader, should I look for in someone who I think might be someone, someone who's really me? honest and yeah. asks you hard questions and makes you reflect on things and doesn't shy away from uh, kind of saying, Yeah, you could have done that better, you could have handled that better, let's let's talk about that. So I think that's really important. You've got to have trust with that person. Uh, so I think and developing that over a bit of time, you have to invest in it and uh, and prioritise it. You know, don't skip the meetings or put them off or think something else is more important. You've actually got to say, if I'm going to be the best I can in this role, then I need to actually invest that time in the reflection and in trying to be better. Over the years you've been very active in professional organisations including a recent stint as president of the ANZA and just going back to the leadership development, I know you were part of um, the programme, I don't know if it's still running, but of developing young and up and coming leaders. Um, do you recommend this type of involvement as a way of developing or honing a skill set that you might not be able to get in the workplace? Oh, absolutely. I learned so much through my involvement with uh, Lianza and starting right from being involved in committees uh, for various special interest groups, um, health libraries and special libraries and I think you learn how to work as part of a committee, you learn skills like chairing meetings, uh, you learn how to organise events, you learn how to get on with a wide range of people. <laughs> And I think, uh, interestingly, you know, being part of a membership organisation has a, a number of challenges as well. Um, so I've learnt a huge amount and really value both the relationships that I've developed through being part of the ANZA and just that practical experience in all of those areas you mentioned. As a GM of a government department, what do you see as your role in developing or contributing to a strong and healthy organisational culture? Mm, that's such a good question because I think organisational culture is so important uh, to how you deliver your services, um, to you know, having staff who enjoy coming to work and uh, and get that sense of satisfaction from, from doing their, their work. So I think, you know, there are two aspects to culture and one is that kind of um, the top down and, and then the, the bottom up. And I see my role as helping to, to be really clear about what is the culture we want here. Uh, and then having or providing the platform to have the conversations that say, well, if we say you know, we're, we're going to be a, a learning organisation, for example, what does that mean? What does that look like? What do you see? What do you feel? How do you know when you are a learning organisation? Uh, and I think we've got a way to go. One of the things that I often uh, think about is when you come into the building here in Malso Street, it's the National Library and yet there's not a book in sight. Yeah, that's true. What does that say? <laughs> um, 
would you know that we were a learning organisation or a knowledge organisation uh, when you just walk in? Not necessarily. So, but part of that too is that National Library isn't just about books, it's, it's about photographs and manuscripts and, and the digitising of our tauma. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, you walk into that space and you could be anywhere. There isn't mm -hmm. anything that says National Library. That's right. So I think we've got some opportunities with the, um, the Tahuhu programme to, to think a bit more about our spaces and what they reflect when you come in. And yes, you're right, libraries are more than books, but I think books are that really tangible uh, kind of demonstration of knowledge and, and what we're about. So they're kind of symbolic. People still expect books in the library. <laughs> they do. They do. A trust in an organisation is important from both an internal, the staff, and external client's perspective. What steps does National Library take to build and maintain trust in its organisation? I think for me there are some aspects, um, well the key aspect to building trust is that you do what you say you will. So you have that integrity uh, in terms of if we say we'll provide this service, then we do provide that service. Uh, so I think demonstrating competence and following through on what you do is really important. Um, maintaining that kind of faith with your, your community. The National Library has faced some public criticism in regard to aspects of its recent policies. What preparation or training have you had to deal with this? Do you get media training through the organisation? Uh, do you get support to face journalists' questions and, and so on? Mm -hmm. I have had some media training. Uh, which was really useful and uh, I, I think the, the key thing that I've learnt recently is just to take a bit of time to actually prepare before you go into an interview. Think really, care, really um, clearly about what are those key messages, what are the things that you need to get across. It's very, uh, it is challenging in the media I think uh, these days because um, the way the news is framed is to be quite polarising. Yeah. So uh, there, it's not really news if, if it's a message that says we want to work together. <laughs> it's, not, you know, it, it's trying to always set up that, um, uh, yeah, that division because that, that generates the interest. And what strategies do you have in place to bolster personal resilience in the face of these added stresses? Oh yeah, that's a good one. Um, I think I'm still working on that. Uh, I think it's really important to um, to keep active and to, you know, for me, fitness. So I walk the dog every morning, uh, although I didn't this morning because it was really raining. Um, so. I also bought an e-bike at the beginning of the year and I bike into work, which I love. And I think just having a bit of a gap and a um, time to leave work at work, although you know these days with Zoom meetings and working from home and lockdowns and things, it's much harder to, to have that separation. But I think it is really important to have time out. Um, I try not to do lots of um, checking emails and so on uh, in the evenings or at the weekends. Sometimes inevitably I have to, but I think you really need that break. Uh, being kind of available the whole time just is too much of a drain. And, and doing those things like I was saying before about uh, spending time with staff doing their work, you know, I think that just thinking about what brings a bit of joy and what, um, what refills your bucket a bit. Yeah, focusing on those things. And I think with COVID-19 and working from home, we've all felt at times a little overwhelmed with the expectation we're on and available because we haven't gone anywhere. And that's, um, that's proved stressful for, for everyone. But what challenges have you faced with leading teams working remotely, particularly when here in Wellington and Christchurch, we've been operational, 
uh, at a different level to Auckland who haven't been uh, as free as we have. So what, what were the challenges of remote working and leadership? Mm, well, uh, you're right. I mean, that has been a real challenge and having a team based in Auckland we've been very conscious that they've been in a different situation to the rest of the country. So what we've done is had regular meetings to connect. And you know, there was a, a point where I think some of us in Wellington were starting to think, oh, do we still need these meetings? And colleagues in Auckland were really clear, yes, we do. You know, We need to still feel connected with what you're doing. Uh, and similarly with regular email messages that I send out to staff, I was kind of thinking, oh, they'll be so bored, will they still be reading these? And so I asked, and, and the feedback was overwhelmingly, yes, please, we still need these, we still want to feel connected, we still need to know that you're thinking of us and you're recognising the different situation that we're in. So I think being very deliberate about making sure that you have those opportunities for connection, and just doing the odd thing like sending a care package every now and again, just you know, something physical and tangible that says we've got you, you know. Yeah, yeah it's, just, it's been a tough time for many. Perhaps a bit of a redundant question for someone in your position, but did you know that Wellington City Libraries has a wide range of resources to support all aspects of business leadership and management? And they're freely available. <laughs> Yes, I did, and yes, I do use the library. So I do tend to use, um, use mainly e-books, uh, but I have always enjoyed the, the resources available, and I think we're very lucky in this city in terms of the, um, the library services that we have. That we are. Mm -hmm. There's a fantastic range. Every time I go looking for something, I find a whole lot of stuff I didn't even think to look for. Goodness, we have that. It's there. It's great. And finally, because I know you're busy, um, what advice do you have for someone who's got their eye on your job? Come and talk to me. <laughs> Let me know, and uh, and I'll be very encouraging. I think uh, I think to, yeah, talking to people in senior positions about their experience, about how they you know what their leadership journey has been about the things that um, now that they're in that role, when they reflect back, you know, what are the key things that have helped enable them to, to be in that role? What are the things that they wish they'd done differently or the things that they're still working on developing? I think that would give you real insights. I think getting involved in professional associations, saying yes to opportunities, um, being brave, making mistakes, all of that is how you learn. I think probably the key thing for wanting to be in a, in a leadership role is that you need to be prepared to be uncomfortable because that's how you learn. If you stay somewhere where you're really comfortable, you're not going to learn and you're not going to grow and you're not going to be ready for those bigger opportunities. So, yeah, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. <laughs> That's excellent advice. Rachel, thank you for taking time to talk to us today. It's been mm. lovely. Thank, thank you. you.